Welcome to the second of two A-level sociology screencasts introducing the component one media topic. So in the previous screencast we define what we mean by this term the mass media and we also considered the kind of impact that the mass media might have on its audience by looking at the mass media as a potential source of ideological power. And in this second introductory screencast, we're going to look at how the role of the mass media has changed in recent years. Now, most sociologists would argue that the mass media has become an increasingly important source of secondary socialisation. And one of the main reasons for that is this concept of media saturation. Media saturation is the idea that in contemporary society, there really is no escape from the mass media, that we're constantly bombarded by media images of one kind or another because we spend so much of our lives looking at screens. And this, of course, is linked to uh, wireless technologies and mobile devices, uh, which mean that being online all day is now the norm for some. And wireless technologies and mobile devices are a part of what sociologists call the new media. So the term new media refers to the move to digital online media as opposed to the old media that was analogue or print based. And most of you watching this would have grown up in a digital and online world. And this is why uh, many people would refer to your generation as the internet generation or uh, digital natives because it's presumed that your generation are completely familiar with such forms of media and expect an, uh, an anytime, anywhere media that's always online. Whereas older people who were born before the existence of digital technology are sometimes referred to as digital immigrants as they've had to adapt to these technologies later on in life and are therefore uh, not as comfortable with these new forms of media. And as this cartoon uh, implies, this can sometimes create uh, a generational digital divide. Now, the way in which we've been using online digital media has changed relatively recently with the advent of Web 2.0. So in the mid-1990s, most of the World Wide Web uh, consisted of pages of static content with very little in the way of user-generated content and interactivity. Whereas now, there are web applications uh, that allow uh, a community of users to interact with websites and each other by adding or updating the content. And examples that we'll all be familiar with would include social networking sites like Facebook and Twitter and other web-based communities, uh, hosted services like Google Documents, uh, web applications like Gmail, video sharing sites such as YouTube, uh, wikis such as Wikipedia, uh, blogs and so on. Uh, this is the, the new way in which we use the World Wide Web. So Web 2.0 uh, is this idea of interactivity and user-generated content. And Web 2.0 makes uh, direct communication easy and attractive, uh, especially since wireless technologies and mobile devices mean uh, that being online all day is increasingly the norm uh, for many people. So because of these new web applications and uh, the availability of wireless communication devices, more of us now uh, are willing to post material and help create content online. In fact, Web 2.0 means that users increasingly expect to be able to do this. So David Gauntlet argues this has changed the nature of media audiences. We can no longer assume uh, that the media audience is a kind of mass of uh, people who passively consume uh, media products that are given to them by media professionals. Instead, we need to consider the fact that media audiences now are much more actively involved, not just in consuming media content, but in producing media content. So David Gauntlet uses this term, uh, prosumers, 
to describe uh, this new type of media audience where consumers are also producers of media content. Now initially Web 2.0 and mobile devices seem mainly to be about people socialising and mainly about entertainment. But it's become increasingly clear uh, that these devices have also played a really important role uh, in political protest. And citizen journalism is one manifestation of this. So citizen journalism is the idea that the news uh, is no longer exclusively produced by professional journalists uh, working for media corporations, that what's happened uh, because of the internet and smartphones with cameras on them is ordinary individuals uh, have been turned into citizen journalists. So this gives ordinary protesters the opportunity to shape the news agenda and to challenge the accounts of the government, the police or the corporate media. And this is why Paul Mason, uh, the Channel 4 journalist, argues that whenever we see a big political protest now, virtually anywhere in the world, uh, in the crush of every crowd, we see arms holding mobile phones in the air, like small flocks of ostriches, snapping scenes of repression or revolt, offering instant and indelible image capture to a global audience. And Paul Mason is very optimistic about the impact of this type of citizen journalism. He argues that because of these new technologies, uh, truth can now travel faster than lies and all propaganda becomes instantly flammable. In other words, it's much more difficult now for authorities to uh, conceal things like police repression of protesters uh, and images uh, of things like police repression uh, often go viral uh, over the internet uh, creating a powerful feedback loop. And the Spanish sociologist Manuel Castells argues that new media, so wireless communications, Web 2.0, offer the possibility of creating autonomous networks of communication which can bypass the control uh, of governments and corporations of the mass media. And this might mean that the Marxist view of the media that we considered in the last screencast might not be quite as relevant when we're assessing the role of new media. Uh, the internet in particular opens up lots of possibilities for groups to present counter-ideologies of their own, which may challenge uh, the ideology of the ruling class. And the potential for protest groups to use new media to challenge and resist the power of ruling groups has clearly been shown by a number of recent protests. For example, Twitter's uh, potential as a political tool became apparent uh, in Iran in 2009, uh, when there were very significant political protests after a disputed election. And because the Iranian government uh, banned all media reporting of these protests, the protesters turned to Twitter to let the world know uh, what was going on inside Iran. And in just 18 days, protesters tweeted over 2 million times. And at the peak of the protests, there were 200,000 tweets every hour. So the protesters were able to become citizen journalists in order to make uh, sure that the world knew uh, what was going on inside Iran. Now, if you've been following international news over the last few years, uh, you might be familiar with this term, the Arab Spring. This is a term that's been given uh, to recent political protests uh, against corrupt dictatorships in many Arab countries. And this started in Tunisia in December 2010. And as we shall see when we consider this example in more detail in class, uh, tools like Facebook and Twitter and YouTube were really important in the organisation of these political protests and also the reporting of these political protests. In fact, some commentators are sometimes referred to the Arab Spring as the Facebook revolution. And recent political protests uh, have created what we call global memes. So a meme is an idea 
uh, behaviour or style uh, that spreads from person to person within a culture. And examples of memes that have spread uh, via the global media include things like the Occupy movement that was inspired by the occupation at Tahir Square uh, during the Arab Spring. So that style of protest then inspired protest movements in Europe, uh, in America and also in this country. And another meme that has spread uh, via the global media uh, in terms of political protest is the V for Vendetta uh, Guy Fawkes mask. And we'll talk about uh, the significance of this in class. OK, so what I've tried to do in these first two screencasts is to give you a feel for some of the main debates uh, that underpin this new topic area. So we've been looking at what we mean by the mass media, we've been talking about the impact the media might have on audiences, and we've been talking about some of the most significant changes uh, to the mass media. What we're going to do in the next screencast is move on uh, to this topic, where we're going to look at issues to do with ownership and control of the mass media in more detail.